month, I want to champion and give a platform for individuals um, who are doing so much in our Bach community for our Black communities. Today, I am speaking to Rob Mitchell from the Black Family Support Group. Rob, very good to see you again. Um, let's continue the discussion and conversation we had um, a few months ago. But first, please introduce, introduce um, the organization that you represent and what you're doing in Bar. Thanks, Vera. Um, hi, thank you for giving us a chance to speak and uh, again. And I work for the Black Families Education Support Group. My name is Rob Mitchell and I'm the Supplementary School Coordinator. Uh, Black Families Education Support Group has been going for about 25 years and my manager Jason Pegg has been there for a good 20 of them. And the organization was set up in order to respond to the kind of ingrained systematic inequalities within education from simple kind of, the kind of racism we think of every day, such as name calling and abuse and, and bullying through to expectations of a teacher. What does a teacher expect of a black child? And does it differ, for example? And the same could work for class or gender as well, but expectations around that kind of thing. And the work we do or how that work manifests is the supplementary school is one thing, which has proven in the UK and probably around the world to be a really useful supplement to mainstream education. The biggest missing piece, if you like, being around things like black history, identity and heritage. Um, so we'd be less likely to focus on core subjects like ICT and math, although one could, um, and more likely to focus on things like history and heritage and exploring things like uh, race, race equality, uh, that might not take place in schools. And also, most importantly, the group, uh, when we used to meet, we're all on Zoom these days, but when we meet, and still when we meet on Zoom, it's a platform to speak about issues such as race or, uh, or ethnicity or, or issues that, that our young people uh, in their secondary schools have faced. And it's a chance for them to talk about things which might otherwise get lost or get confused or become too overblown or might make them feel totally isolated. And the ability to meet each other uh, in a place like uh, Bath, where there are children who are black, mixed race, or whatever, if I use that word term, well, we've had the conversation about that term and the complications around those terms before, Vera, but I'll use the terms anyway, um, where they're quite isolated. So there would be, there would be like a very, very small minority within the school. So if they're facing issues which may be race related, should we say, um, then they would be facing it on their own. Whereas if I take myself as an example, I went to school in, uh, well, when I returned to England in about eight years old, I went to school in East London. And I'd say there was probably a good mix between white, Asian, black. And when I say black, I mean like Caribbean, African, mostly Caribbean at the time. So, and we suffered loads of <laughs> abuse, but we gave as much as we got, if you like, within that context. Uh, but it wasn't isolating because if someone calls you a name, some racist name, it's very clear it's not you personally because the person next to you got the same name so I mean that doesn't help the situation in the bigger picture but at that individual micro level at the time for example that helps so in Bath without that sense of other people like of your ethnicity you know getting the same stuff it can be very isolating and has a massive impact on mental health educational attainment etc so um, that's just a supplementary school <laughs> but it's also mentoring work and there's casework that goes on so when uh, families in Bath, black families in Bath have issues which they believe or feel to be racially motivated, then that's the work, for example, Jason would be getting involved in, which is uh, representing, I guess, or helping parents and pupils to access the higher echelons of schools, which are pretty hierarchical and pretty inaccessible if you don't feel entitled or confident enough to go and deal with them. Thank you, Rob. I, I think you are highlighting here very well how often it's even more difficult if you are in a very small minority in a city like Bath um, to, be, to be heard and to be seen and not to be overlooked. Um, and, and that's why um, organizations like you are just so very important to us. Tell me, what does Black History Month mean to you? Well, it's a complex one, Black History Month, because it's obviously something that can only work within a white context, if you like, because Black history is a response to the idea that is that 
I won't call it white, well, let's call it white history actually, because there's notions of Eurocentricism, which I guess the world sent from a Eurocentric perspective. There's ideas of white supremacy, which is if we, when we heard the term, we often think about it in terms of Ku Klux Klan and hooded things and burning crosses, but actually it's much more subtle, much more ingrained and much more nuanced than that also. So within the context of that, history, i.e. the stories we collectively tell ourselves about where we've come from and therefore who we are, tend to be slanted in the Eurocentric white supremacist line. So black history, I guess, is a response from um, the 60s, if you like, I think it started off as Negro History Week or something like that in America all this time ago, um, is an Afrocentric response to trying to counter the damage that um, history, Eurocentric history, white supremacist history has done to the idea of and the concept of the understanding and the identity of black people. And when I say black, I mean, like I said, that's a complicated word because some people have, I mean, like I said, it was, in the 60s it was called Negro History Week. Some people in the UK think it should be called African History Month. So now there's a whole move toward, towards Diversity Month, all of which have contestations at different points and different stages, which goes to show some of the problems we have. But essentially it's a response to try to erase some of the psychic and, and cultural damage that history as standard without, let's call it history, um, uh, in Eurocentric guise, if you like, has done to the, the idea, the image, the understanding of what uh, a black person is. Um, and black, just qualify that very quickly. Um, once again, black is one of those things that can only be seen in terms of white, because if we're in Africa, for example, in Nigeria, then we might be you know, having Igbo history month because let's say the, another people or whatever feel a dominant group. So we, black only works within the white context, if you like. Um, and it's a response to try to reclaim some of that damage. It, and I think often, not often, absolutely specifically as a result of transatlantic slavery and the removal four five centuries ago of Africans from Africa to populate and work within and generate wealth on, for Europe in Africa, sorry, in the Caribbean, in South America and in North America. Um, so um, that's why we are black because we're not Igbo or we're not Ga or we're not Twi or something. So we are people who've been removed from our histories, removed from cultures and our primary purpose has been to serve the economic interests of the wealth generating wealth generation in Europe, including Bath. Um, there's quite a lot of pushback currently, which worries me. But at the same time, you can, can see and hear from what you're saying that uh, you know they, they, you talk about damage. So of course, there there, there then immediately is um, a degree of defensiveness. But wouldn't you also say, which is always my point, that um, to widen our understanding of history can only be a good thing and to widen our diversity and the diversity of views, you know, while some of it might be very difficult and hard, um, you know, for white people to, to finally acknowledge and understand. And um, there should also be a joy in, in the fact that we are learning more, we are understanding better, and a diverse history is a better history. C could you say something um, around the sort of um, the positive side of doing this as well, so that yet people don't just all see it as a sort of negative attack on, on white history, but also, that it is enriching for all of us. Absolutely, sorry. If that's how it came across, don't get me wrong. I, I guess I'm trying to not to fall into certain traps, if you like, and I think nuance is quite important. So it's, this is certainly my take on what it is. Um, now, with the old Black History Month, it definitely has a use in terms of understanding within schools and stuff, because schools especially, schools love it. So they, it's a hook and schools, teachers are very creative at turning anything into learning. and with this hook, it's very useful. With the, now in Black History Month, um, there's lots of institutions within uh, uh, Britain, um, because it doesn't fall the same place everywhere. In February, I think it is in America. In Britain, there are lots of people who are open to that conversation, it's become a thing, Black History Month, Black History Month, Black History Month. So it's useful to be able to get our story on the table, just as I guess um, the whole Black Lives Matter movement has put that agenda on the table. So it didn't just emerge with Black Lives Matter, likewise, Black History and all the stuff that goes with it didn't just emerge with Black History Month. So Black History Month is a useful tool for widening history for sure. Um, I, and in terms of push back, 
it, um, I guess the pushback is probably more about Black Lives Matter, but they're all probably also building up around Black History Month as well. I'm sure you just for even having this conversation around Black History Month, you'll get a certain comeback from people who say, how dare you, or why you have, why don't you have White History Month, or people who have all sorts of things to you for doing this kind of thing. Um, so in that context, I think it is really important to educate people about why it's significant, why it's important, and why we have such a thing. Um, if I may be permitted to jump to a slightly different subject, um, I, I'm not sure if I'll answer that question, but uh, yeah, I, I, think, I, I think it, 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 it is so, so important to me to keep the conversation positive um, and, and, and make, it, make it something from, from which we all learn and we all grow. Um, and, uh, and, and you have answered that very well. It, it is about embracing this in a positive way. I, I, absolutely. And that's, yeah, I mean, I won't take away the value of it. I, what I would add is the fact that it's not um, without its questions or problems or further complications. So I do embrace it on that level because I buy into it as much as anybody else because I recognize if there's a willing audience, i.e. the schools, to take the workshop or to do some more work for somebody, then by all means, bring it on. I don't have a problem in that respect. Thank you so much. Um, you know, a, a real insight. I, I, I hope we can keep that conversation going, uh, make it challenging. Um, of course, that has to be um, part of it, but also um, keep it very positive. Um, and I'm looking forward to having many more conversations with you again. Thank you so much, Rob. Thank you very much, Vera. Have a good day.